Hello and welcome to yet another one of our almost monthly live office hours with Dr. Chuck. Like always, I have a few things that I want to cover and, um, and I'll talk a little bit, uh, but I am going to be watching the chat. It'll be coming up behind me in just a moment. I'll be watching the chat. Uh, one of the things that uh, occurred to me uh, that we did, I don't know if we did it last time, but we did it two times ago, was um, we actually treated it like office hours, which kind of surprised me in that um, people ask questions about the course or about their assignments, and we just tried to figure that out. And... Um, you know, and, I, and so feel free to say, work on problem six from Django for everybody. Although it might take me a little long, but I, I can share my screen and we can, I can show you. I can answer your questions on a homework. Um, that, that's what office hours are. I mean, uh, traditional office hours at a university are, are part of a public outreach and a student outreach. I have uh, office hours tonight for my on-campus students from seven to nine and just people drop in and ask me whatever questions. And you might wonder sort of how that works and why that works. And our deans, when it's time uh, for uh, September to start, and school to start in September, they're, they're like, give me your office hours. And we have this big spreadsheet and we all fill out a spreadsheet about office hours. And and the reason is, is office hours are a really important part of being a faculty member. And the, the reason is, is that we faculty members are really busy. We're very, very busy. And like I was hanging out at a lake this weekend and in between fun things like making hamburgers on the grill and eating and taking a quick boat ride, I was working this, this past weekend. I was working on... Um, my open source project Sakai. I was working on fixing a bug between uh, our assignments tool and externally launched um, externally launched LTI tools. And so I was working and as soon as I'm done here I'll go grab a bite of lunch and I'll be banging on this keyboard. I don't know if you, you can't see from here but you can see that this is a really old laptop. This is a, a 2000 and 13 laptop and it's because it has all the right plugs on it and I don't want to upgrade my laptop because I all the new laptops have plugs I don't like um, but you can see here that I've been using this so long that I've worn like four or five of the keycaps I've worn the print right off of them like the control key it's just <laughs> after almost 10 years going to maybe make a laptop to the point where I might buy a new one. But I haven't bought a new laptop in a long time because I don't like the current Apple laptops. But back to office hours. I'm a busy guy. My, If you think about my life and my priorities um, professionally, my number one uh, professional priority is my on-campus classes. Lectures, on-campus students, they pay a lot of money to go to University of Michigan and I'm their teacher and I am responsible in a 15-week period to create a really valuable and useful educational experience. And so I have lectures on Fridays, and so I'm teaching two classes, well, three actually. I'm teaching the equivalent of Django for Everybody on, on campus, SI 364 and SI 264. And I'm also teaching online the equivalent of Postgres for Everybody, pgfree.com. And... Um, the needs of those classes are my number one priority. And then my number two priority is usually software development on all the open source and open content that I work on. So I work on Sakai, which is an open source learning management system that you've heard me talk about way too much, management systems. I'm like, hey, why don't you stop by my office hours? Because that's a time that I have um, set aside for reflection. And so... That's why office hours are such an important thing. That's why I call what we do here um, office hours. So let's see. Um, do, 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 yeah. Um, so, so Ruhab, I'm uh, I'm sure that all of the students are lucky to attend your classes in person. Yes, and I'm lucky to teach my classes in person. Um, I, I don't want to be too political. I mean, my mask is right there. 
Uh, we at the University of Michigan have a everyone must be vaccinated policy. The teachers must be vaccinated, the staff must be vaccinated, and the students must be vaccinated. And we have this little application that we run every day to make sure that you know we report in that we have no symptoms. And with that, we have a rule that basically indoors, other than when I'm on this television, indoors I'm supposed to wear a mask. I teach with a mask on. That was a little a scary thought because I like to project. I like to, you know, reach the back of the room. Um, but, you know, after the first, I mean, I've taught two weeks now. After the first uh, first couple hours, I don't really notice them. And, um, and I think as, as we move forward, we're going to start using more and more as, as more people get vaccinated. And it's more of a low-grade fear of getting the infection. I think we'll start using the more comfortable paper blue masks to, that, that are used very commonly in uh, Asian countries like Japan. People wear them for hours. They'll wear them two, three hours a day when they're commuting or walking around or shopping or whatever. And those masks are, are really very comfortable. because And so, so the students are wearing masks inside. I'm wearing a mask inside. People aren't wearing masks outside. And... They're going to football stadiums. We'll see. And my whole philosophy of this is, is that the world is a very complex place and there's lots of opinions out there in the world and people are entitled to their opinions. But here in the, in the United States, at the University of Michigan, in the state of Michigan, which is one of the top five safest states to be in right now from a, a pandemic perspective, it is my feeling that I need, I mean, I could have less risk if I just hid in my house the whole time and did nothing but Zoom. But I also feel like we got to come out of this somehow. And what better place to do research, as it were, and how to get back together and teach in person and be in the same room um, and take, take a little, take small risk, not zero risk, but a small risk, but then at, at all points, you have to ask what the risk and the reward is. And so I think what we're doing here is the ideal place to give it a try. And, you know, if things go wrong, we'll change the rules. If, uh, if things go well, we will have shown a, a path uh, that with enough vaccination and with moderate masking um, and careful testing and good health care that's readily available um, that we can um, we don't have to hide from each other uh, to be safe. And so, so I'm really excited about that. Like I said, it's been two weeks of school and we are all overjoyed to be together. Um, we have a large contingent of students that come from outside the United States and, and, um, and I'm meeting them and it's really cool because I'm sure if uh, you live outside the United States and you're coming to the United States for graduate school that you were worried this whole past you know, six to eight months, whether it was going to work. And, and here everyone is, and they're making it. I haven't heard any real bad stories. Um, I'm sure there are some challenges, but, uh, but we're here. We're, we're doing it, and, um, and I'm really excited about that. And office hours are part of, of all that. So let's see, is there anything else? Uh, do I have offline classes? I don't quite know what that means. Um, so I have offline classes. I think um, Maria, you're saying, do you have offline classes? What that means is, do you have face-to-face -face classes? And the answer is absolutely yes. I have a face-to-face -face lecture from 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock on Friday and a face-to-face -face lecture from 1 to 3 on Friday, teaching Django to my students. So, um, so I really appreciate how you make learning so flawless. I'm not sure it's flawless. Uh, thank you for designing the course so well. So I would disagree with your point about my courses are flawless. My courses are flawed. I get to the point where when you point out a flaw in something, if it, I don't fix it. I'm like, you know what? I think that it's a reward for me to have flaws in the course and for you to know it well enough to find the flaws. Um, so I think the I wonder why it is that my courses do so well. Um, of course, Python for Everybody is the most popular programming course the world has ever seen, literally. It is the most popular programming course, most successful programming course in all of recorded human history. Why? Why me? <clears throat> and I think that I think it all comes down to being relaxed. 
I mean, I'm enjoying myself. Um, I, I wear costumes and I'm not saying that they, you got to wear costumes. I mean, being silly, a little silly and self-deprecating. It's not like someone could write a script to make a professor funny, right? You can't do that. Um, that's just who I am. If you met me or if you'd known me for 20 years, <clears throat> if you'd known me for 20 years, you would know that this is just who I am. I'm not like manufacturing a persona uh, in when I'm teaching or when I'm traveling or when I'm speaking or what I'm doing right now. Um, th this is just me. And I'm the, the one thing that probably uh, makes me a good teacher. It makes me the, the thing that I treasure the most. That is my lived life that leads me to be a good teacher, I think, is the fact that I'm really not what I'd call a genius. I know geniuses, and I watch geniuses. I have colleagues on our faculty, and I won't name any names, but I just look at them and I'm like, you are amazing. Your brain is like a sports car. It is a high-powered, fast, turns really well, and I don't have as good a brain as that person that I'm thinking of right now. I'm, and when I work in the Sakai project, I look at some of our top programmers like um, Adrian and Earl, and I'm like, wow, I just listen to them talk and their brains are so much better than mine. And I can learn from those people. And so the thing I think that is the most precious part of my psyche that makes me a good teacher is that I'm always learning, right? And I'm not smart enough to master anything. I'm always learning. And so if you take my, as an example, and I'm teaching Django on campus right now, if you take my Django for Everybody specialization on Coursera, you will see that it focuses a lot on this thing that I call dj 4 e samples And you can look at that on um, samples.djfree.com. Hopefully it'll run. samples.djfree.com. And so if you take a look at that and you think, wow, this guy is so nice. This guy wrote up all these samples because he's a really good teacher. No, that is not the source of DJ Free samples. The source of DJ Free samples is I'm a really terrible Django programmer. And I forget, continuously forget what it is that I need to do in Django because I don't code in Django all the time. I code in PHP and Java all the time. HTML, CSS, HTML, JavaScript, PHP, Java. That's what I code in all the time. When I'm not teaching, I'm coding in those are the languages. Django, I do Python, but not Django for websites. I do Python to kind of hack things together, like upload and download YouTube transcripts or something. So, the DJ Free Samples, that's part of Django for Everybody, is my own set of notes that I took as I laborious, laboriously or in challenging ways figured out how certain things, weird things, work in Django. And so if you go here, I don't know if I'm even logged in or not, if you go here, oh yeah, you can log in and the username is DJ for samples And then <coughs> there is a password that you have to guess, but you do know it's a two-digit number. And if you don't know what that two-digit number is, like, what have I taught you? I just haven't taught you anything if you do not know what the two-digit number is. Okay, DJ free underscore 42 underscore exclamation. Okay, so let me log in here. Oh, I already have it. That's not the right password, I bet. Oh, maybe it is the right password. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just 42. It's uh, got to put 42 in. Okay. So, and then somewhere in here, you can see the GitHub for this. And, and you're like, okay, this guy's so nice. And the answer is, well, let me tell you something. It turns out that storing pictures in Django is a difficult problem. And so, I wrote a little thing that allows you... Uh, <laughs> okay, I don't know what, it's always dangerous to see student stuff online, but this is a basic little thing where you can upload a picture and 
blah, I don't even know what I'm going to put in as a picture. Let's see. I don't know. Let's just go grab uh, something from here. Put in a picture. Yeah, this is what I was working on. There's a picture. And I'll upload that picture. And it turns out that lots of, lots of, okay, yeah, that was, I was, this is the code I was working on over the weekend. So lots of applications need to build pictures, right? Lots of applications need to put pictures in. And it's just there's a few little weird things in Django that you've got to do. And so I built this little bit of code called Pix. And this represents probably, I mean, I haven't touched it in 13 months, so I got it working. Um, this represents, if you ask me how to do a picture, I have to go look at this models.py file, and I like, okay, that's that's good, I got this, char field, binary field, because it turns out that the way pictures work in Django is how they work going up to the screen is different than how they work into the database, and then so you've got to have, um, you've got to have this code uh, in this forms.py to add to the models.py, and this is the real brains of the operation right here. And and it really, the hard part is like right here. This code, lines 25 through 30, and line this code. That probably took me days to figure out. If you just look at it, I copy and paste it to my new project, and it's like takes me minutes to figure out. And so the pain or the effort that I put in to figure out how to make this simple, it's a simple concept, right? Upload a file, take a look at the file, and then go like that. Boop, boop, yeah, okay, go back to all picks. This is what you do in applications as you have these little nuggets of, of, of solving problems. And so the thing that makes me a good teacher is that I need to write these things down. I am not so good at Django that I just have at the ready the whole idea of a picture. I just don't. And so when you ask me a question, and if you guys figure out, um, you know, um, when you guys figure out, <clears throat> oh, I forgot what I was going to say. I was reading this stuff. Okay. Jimmy, thank you for the Web Applications for Everybody course. Loved it. I still think that web applications for everybody is like one of some of my best work. I really think, uh, let's see, I did my graduate school from Bowling Green State University in Ohio. I had to return back to the COVID situation. Um, I never miss my learnings from the U.S. when I attend your classes. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah. So I'm sorry I missed you. I mean, people do stop by, and I've had people stop by my physical office hours in the pre times, right? Um, so let's see, Dean. I got to see a great bunch of new names. This is cool. Um, hello, Chuck. Can you teach any data science courses? So, Sarath, that's a good question. And the answer is no. And the reason is I'm not smart enough. And and this is the weirdest thing about teaching the world's most successful beginning programming course, and that is. You think I'm smart at everything. I'm actually pretty good at teaching you how to learn programming for the first time. That's my, that's my special special skill. And, but that doesn't mean that I know NumPy or Pandas or other stuff. And there are other people. And that's why in a faculty at a university, you need lots of people. You need people like me that specialize in getting everybody started. And then you need people like Chris Brooks and others that take you to the next step. And so um, you'll notice that the Applied Data Science with Python specialization on Coursera, I I'm technically somehow a tiny part of it. I don't quite know what I did to deserve that. Um, but uh, Chris Brooks and uh, our other faculty uh, put that together and it's, it's wonderful. And it builds on everything I do. I like data science, I like data manipulation, but I just, I, I don't do it on a daily basis. It's not, it's not something that I consider myself professional grade is on data science. But Chris Brooks, he does data science every day. And so it's great to learn data science from him. Just learn data science from me, uh, not so good. Oh, Maria, yeah. Yeah, so Maria, what, what country are you from? So when I start traveling, we could meet in person, right? 
Um, yeah, it used to be that I would invite people to come to Ann Arbor. And when things get better again, I will invite people to come to Ann Arbor. And I met, like I said, I met students, online students. I've met them in Ann Arbor. That's not, not crazy. Uh, Ruhab, could you please tell us which course we should do after completing Python for everybody if we want to do projects on your own? Which course should help us progress if we don't come from a data science background? So, yeah, that's a good question. So, and I'm thinking about that. I've been thinking about that a lot. And the simple answer, the simplest answer, is it almost doesn't matter. Um, the, the problem is, is that just completing Python for everybody does not mean that you're a programmer. And it, it turns out that, and you say it in your statement, um, do projects on our own. What you need to do is you need to practice. And so a common question that I get that I always say no to because I can't figure out how to do it is why don't you have more practice problems in Python for everybody? Okay, you go through chapter five or go through chapter six, it's strings, right? And then I, 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 I have this lecture and I've got a quiz and I got some homework and, and then you're like, I want more. I want advanced strings. And I'm like, my brain doesn't calculate that. I have figured out exactly the minimum that you need to know about strings to go on. And I'm going to teach you that. And I'm going to make an assignment that's small, not big. And that's why people are successful in the class is because I make small assignments and because I'm not obsessed in all of the advanced features of everything. And I get, and you probably can agree with me on that and say, well, that's good, Chuck. I see where you're coming from. But you want more. You want to be more skilled. You want me. And so for me, I, I don't want to say, here's chapter six, and this is what you need to know, and then here's the advanced stuff. Because I'm afraid that you will be tempted to try the advanced stuff. And if you don't succeed in the advanced stuff, then you will you will look poorly on yourself. You'll like, mm, I couldn't do the advanced stuff, so I'm terrible. No, you're not terrible. You did the basic stuff, and that was enough to learn. And yeah, on that next day, you couldn't do the advanced stuff. And so it's you will never see extra credit in a class course I teach, right? I, I hate extra credit. I hate it. I do not know why teachers use it. It's a terrible, terrible concept. Because guess what? There is no such thing as extra credit. There really isn't. So I'm like, oh, you can do this and get some extra credit. It's like, guess what? I, as a student, have heard every time a teacher says that to me. you got to do it. Because guess what? If half the students do the extra credit and you don't, you're at some disadvantage. You do not know right now what that disadvantage is, but some students are going to do better than you, and that extra credit is going to get looked at if some point in the future, right? And so the problem is, is why make it extra credit? Why make an advanced thing? But back to your question of what to do after Python for everybody. And I just, I get all like, I don't want to build you an advanced Python class. What you need to do is practice and do projects, which is what you said in your comment, and that was you wanted to do projects. Guess what? If you take Django for everybody, I make you do projects. And it's advanced Python. It's everything you want. And you're learning something else at the same time. You're not just doing more, more repetitive, mind-numbing practice on strings. When you do Django for everybody, you're doing strings all the time. You're doing object-oriented Python all the time. I frankly think that the only way you're going to ever learn object-oriented Python is take Django for everybody. And the reason is, is that you cannot teach object-oriented Python as a synthetic idea. You just can't. It's not like math is 1 plus 1 is 2, and then later you get to use addition. Object-oriented programming is not a foundational idea. There is no foundational notion. There is... The foundational skill of object-oriented programming is understanding the syntax of objects in Python. So if you look at Python for everybody, I teach you the syntax of object-oriented programming. I don't teach you anything about how to use it, right? And so I say, well, you have this class, and then you have some defs, and then you have this thing called self, and then you have these variables outside of this thing, and then self dot refers to those things. 
That is syntax. That has nothing to do with why the world uses or invents object oriented programming. But I tell you what, when I'm halfway through Django for everybody, we're like digging into object oriented programming because you really can't do Django without understanding object oriented programming. If you look at that code I just show you on how you did a picture in Django, it's all about object oriented programming and it's overriding methods. Like in Python for everybody, I'm like, here's how you override a method. Like you'd be like, why am I overriding a method? Well, in Django, we're overriding the method because we have to do pictures. And if we don't override those clean methods, we have no way to jack into the right spot. And you're like, why jack in? Well, come to the Django class. And so the point is that it almost doesn't matter. And so Django for everybody, and then take web applications for everybody. It's not even, it's not even Python. It doesn't matter. Because what happens is if you take enough classes, eventually you have muscle memory for programming. You have brain memory. You have like natural reactions. When I'm coding, like I did this weekend on Sakai, I was not remembering how an if statement works. I was not remembering how object oriented has different public and private and static and all that. That is muscle memory to me. That's just automatic. So I'm like, okay, what do I want the user interface to look like? And do I have enough data in the back end data model to make that work? Yeah, I think so. And that's when you're actually creating and building. And so literally it doesn't matter. So you don't even have to take my class. Go take the Rice University Python class on Coursera if you think that building a game would be fun. I think that building a game in Python, you know, I just... I don't want to be a game designer. I wish I could build games just for fun for myself. But you know, I don't just think that gaming is the purpose of computing. I just You can't really get a job with gaming. But I would like to build a game. I really want to pay somebody to build a game that I design. I got some great game design. I, well, no, I wouldn't say great. I got some game design ideas that are in my head that I'd like to see put into practice. So maybe I should take the Rice course. So what should you take after Python for everybody? And that is more programming and in particular do it quickly. Because what you learned in Python for everybody was not, is not gonna stick. And so you want it, and that, so I, I think Python for everybody, Django for everybody is really a beautiful and ideal way to go about doing it. Because you, Django for everybody is a quick switch to the applications of Python. But, uh, but if you took another course, uh, it'd be good. Um, if you're looking at different topics, um, you know, if you're thinking in data, about data science, the other topic that you really got to kind of get is programming and statistics because statistics and programming are, to me, the essence of data science. And if you're into data science, my Postgres class, Postgres for everybody, is, is SQL as a core foundational language skill. That's just essential because SQL and databases conceive of computation differently and in beautiful ways than um, Python. Yeah. Yeah, so Pranam, I just, I just answered your question. Um, yeah, so Sumita, Sumita uh, how many should be implemented hands-on? I would say um, what you should do is you should work on learning until you take a class and you feel like you're a Jedi Master and you're like, <laughs> well, that was easy. Then maybe you're, you've learned enough, right? And so, um, and, and so for me, I think you go until it starts feeling easy. One of the things I've recommended is people take Python class after Python class after Python class. So um, we have uh, a number of faculty who teach Python here at the school of information. Like we got Paul Resnick, we got Steve Oney, we got Barb Erickson. And um, Paul and Steve made a uh, MOOC called Python 3 on Coursera. And uh, Barb Erickson is making a MOOC called, uh, I don't know what she's calling it, but it's on FutureLearn, aimed at teachers in a different way. And literally, you can take three MOOCs from the University of Michigan about Python, and we're all up and down the same hallway in an office. and you think, well, isn't that kind of dumb? We got one. Chuck's got a Python class. And the answer is no, it is not dumb. You could take every Python class, and then at some point, 
Maybe you've taken one, maybe you've taken two, maybe you take the rice course, maybe you take four. But when you're feeling like, when you're feeling like you're a Jedi master, you can stop taking Python courses. And so I'm all about mastery learning. I'm not about like rushing learning. I'm about learning, internalizing, and mastering. And so you, you can't hurt to take more classes. And if you go off and do a bunch of, of self-directed projects with no support, you're, you're likely to find yourself like falling off the edge. And then you're like, oh, I guess I'm dumb. And I guess I don't know anything. Well, no, take the rice class. You got lectures, you got projects, they're all structured, you're going down a path, you gotta you gotta fuse it all together and do your homework. And that's that's what makes you good, is the fusing of all the knowledge that you're given. But at least it's structured. So it's not like I can give you a project, say, build a thing, and then then by you building the thing, you know more. No, if I give you a project in Django for everybody, I give you the skills that I my skills and resources and and whatever, so that you can succeed at it. And so wouldn't you rather like do a DIY project where I've given you everything you need to succeed or Rice has given you everything or Barbara has given you everything to succeed at it? Why not? Why not just keep learning from classes? Um, and uh, and so that's, that's to me the, you just, it's, it's great. You know, it's kind of like, uh, being a runner or being a swimmer, you kind of finally reach that point where your your rhythm just works, and and it's really about like how far you're gonna go, not like how to swim. Okay. Uh, learning databases, Alex. Uh, which one would you recommend to learn first, Postgres, SQL? So, Alex, that's a great question. Uh, okay, Pranab, I will talk on that next about so many resources, and I'll tell you my unique take on that. But let's go to Alex's question first. Uh, so how would I go about start learning databases? Which one do you recommend to learn first, Postgres SQL? So I think it almost doesn't matter. Um, if you take all my classes, you will use SQLite, which is a great first database to play with. Python for Everybody uses SQLite. Django for everybody uses SQLite and switches to MySQL halfway through. And then Web Applications for everybody uses only MySQL. And Postgres for everybody uses Postgres. And I love that. I love the fact that in the curriculum that I've been building, there is... Um, in the curriculum I've been building, there are three databases because if there's one thing you need to learn about databases is that there's more than one of them. And choosing the right database for a large project is very different than learning databases. Because if you're going into data science, you might be dropped into a thing that says, oh, we got this data lake that we made up ourselves, but here's a, you can use SQL. And then, and, and then it'll be like, well, but the SQL is a little weird. This works and this works, but we got this special little extension that we put in here. So you just got to do that. And so you need to be looking at that and go, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. I've, I've got four databases under my belt, and that just extension. I kind of understand that SQL is, there's not one SQL. There are many different SQLs. And so if you just want to learn database by itself, Postgres for everybody is designed to be an intense um, intermediate to advanced database class that talks about adopting databases, about tuning databases, about database performance, about different kinds of indexes. And Postgres is a really great database to teach you all that because Postgres has really good JSON support built into it, has really good full text support built into it. Postgres is becoming a popular NoSQL database and it, it's just, it's a, you can treat Postgres like an SQL or a NoSQL database and then a hybrid between them. So Postgres is really a big winner. And if you look at, um, uh, and so there's a difference between learning. You should learn many, but for using, I think Postgres is a really, really good choice. The only, the only other good choice I think is uh, SQL Server. If you're stuck in a company that uses all Microsoft, sorry. But if you are and you're making money, making money is okay. So SQL Server is fine. Um, I'm not a fan of Oracle, 
and I have uh, used MySQL for the last 30 years, and uh, I was a fan of it until Oracle bought it. And so I'm, get, I'm getting nervous about Oracle, and luckily Postgres is pretty awesome, and so I'm kind of, the reason I didn't teach Postgres for everybody is why it wasn't called MySQL for everybody is because I don't like MySQL. I'm just worried about the future of MySQL. And so, um, just like I say, take more than one Python course, I think you need to be exposed to database over and over and over again. And so if you follow my curriculum, Python for everybody, Django for everybody, web applications for everybody, Postgres for everybody, you ought to have a pretty good feeling about databases by the end of those four specializations. So, And so, um, so I'm going to go back to Pranav's question. Hi, Dr. Chuck. I get overwhelmed sometimes by so many resources available on the Internet to learn stuff. How to overcome this and learn efficiently. Please talk on this. Okay, so this will seem self-serving, but the simple way to go through life is to just exclusively take courses from Dr. Chuck. So I, I, when I first started, I built one course, Internet History, Technology and Security. Wow, that's a long time ago. And um, I never knew I'd be able to teach more than one course. And so I just taught something that I thought was going to be awesome. I'd seen courses like Modern Poetry from, uh, from U University of Pennsylvania, from, from uh, Penn. And I'm like, I wanted something like Mod Po. And I highly recommend Modern Poetry with Al Filarese. And it's fall, so it's pumpkin spice latte in the United States time. And it's Mod Po time around the world. So... Uh, Mod Po is like a happening. Uh, I just adore the work they've done. So I built this one course, and I thought that was going to be the end of this whole uh, MOOC transition. And then I thought, well, I've got this really cool textbook, you know, Python for everybody. And um, why not make a MOOC about Python? I wasn't planning on uh, being the most successful Python course. I was just wanted to throw my hat in the ring, and it turned out our timing was perfect and it's it's been it's been really good and then the other motivation that I've had is every time I teach an on-campus class and all my on-campus classes because I'm not in a computer science department are aimed at beginners I taught a PHP class and then that became web applications for everybody I mean I taught a Python class which was SI 502 became Python for everybody I taught a PHP class which was SI 364 and 664 and that became web applications for everybody they told me to switch to a Python-based web environment, so I switched to Django, and that became Django for everybody. And then they asked me to teach an online uh, database-only class in our Masters of Online Data Science, MADS. And so I turned that into Postgres for everybody. And I literally, at this point, have no new classes that I'm developing for the School of Information, but I've created four specializations, all of which are relatively accessible to beginners, and all of which can, can be somewhat taken in almost any order. You probably want to take Python for everybody first. But, um, but what's happened is, is that the more courses that I've made, the more I start looking at the courses I create as a curriculum, as, as like a degree. And so I'm beginning to think of myself as the University of Dr. Chuck, that I have a degree called the doctor, the degree, the Dr. Chuck undergrad or associate's degree in programming from Dr. Chuck. And if you now look at all the stuff that I've produced from Python, Django, PHP, database, I am well along the way to making a whole undergrad degree not in computer science, but in programming. So yes, there's a lot of stuff on the internet, and if you find it overwhelming, just take every one of my classes. I have a plan. I have a plan for you. If you take every one of my classes, they'll fit together, you'll learn easily, you'll learn gently, I won't be a jerk, I won't push you too much in advanced things, at least not in the beginning. Um, everything that I teach you is doable, and you're not going to get all frustrated and you're going to be learning and learning and learning and learning and not only is it available on Coursera and edX and FutureLearn but it's also available 100% free forever on the internet at 
uh, www.pyfree.com. And you can actually see my little, my little thing developing if you go to online.dr-chuck.com. Oh, chuck.com. I'm sure I've told you the story of Dr. online.drchuck.com. Oh, and look, office hours. Let's go check. Uh, the last one was in Kyoto. Hey, live office hours. Here we are. So this is the University of Dr. Chuck, Dr. Chuck Online. Yeah. And I have office hours, right? And so what I'm doing here is I'm slowly but surely building a whole curriculum, like the the associate's degree in programming. And so there are more things coming here. There are more things coming here. And if you start down the path of the Dr. Chuck path, when the time comes, hopefully you'll be ready for the next stuff. Now, I know there are people listening that have taken everything and they would like it if, uh, they would like it if I was already ready for them and I'm not. And the reason that I'm not ready, the reason I'm not ready for you is that building new courses is not my highest priority. My highest priority, as I told you earlier, is my online student, I mean, my on-campus students and software development are my two highest priorities. And then course development, which is something that brings me great joy, is like third, right? Um, so... Hi, I never thought I could learn to code. Thanks so much for, I'm starting a master's in data science in January. Congratulations, Tessu. Uh, any, any advice for a CS, DS undergrad and Pi Free grads who fall in love with coding? Um, so I, I don't know exactly what your question is, but um, I like Japanese culture a lot. So do I. I want to get back to Japan. I had a really cool Japanese restaurant the other day that oh, it reminded me how, the, how it was laid out, the colors, the things that were on the wall reminded me of uh, the Kyoto train station, eating food in the Kyoto train station. And I, I miss it so terribly. I will get there soon. Okay. Uh, any advice? So one of the things that, I, that I'm going to pull out, Tessu, is I'm going to pull out the part about a CS uh, grad or undergrad. Um, I think that uh, a lot of computer science departments do not, do not teach computer science from a perspective of love uh, and joy and happiness and fun. Uh, I get it. Computer science is serious business. It really is. And so I see so many young people who work so hard to get a computer science degree. And when they're done, they don't love it. They don't love, they, they have the skills and knowledge, but they don't love what they do with that. And so I think it's important even with a computer science degree, which leaves you with prodigious skills, which amazing skills. If you survive it, you learn a lot. You need to find a way to, to, to augment what you're doing, what you've learned with like fun and love and joy and happiness and user experience and user interface design and serving people with like working on open source projects. And so I do think that computer scientists um, end up with all these skills, but then the other half of their, their, their persona is completely undeveloped. And so Python for Everybody, Web Application for all this stuff, I think is a great supplement to someone with a, a computer science degree. Yeah, Samita, I learned it saying Python and SQL is a good way to learn with data science roles. Yes, I completely agree. Should we include more skills to that? So. Again, Samita, I would go to Dr. Shock Online. I would take every single one. The skill that I would add is web, web applications. And the reason is not because you're going to build web applications, but a lot of data science has to do with instrumenting web applications. And so if you don't know how a web or a mobile application works, you're kind of like a little bit blind in one, one side. You can't see what they're doing and why they're doing it and why they're asking all these questions because you have never built an application. So I think a data scientist should not necessarily try to be a, a super great front end developer or UI design, but they ought to understand the basics of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, SQL, front end, back end, model view controller, all that stuff. And of course I teach that. So, um, oh, so, so, so Tom, where to put my glasses? Oh, there's my glasses. So 
I actually have a Quora um, that talks about getting a job after taking my classes. Um, I don't know. Let's find it. This actually ended up going into Forbes as well. How can I get my first programming job? So there's there's the URL. Can I, I can I paste that into? Hang on, let me try something here. YouTube. Let me try something. Come on, live, Dr. Chuck. And no, I don't want to play that. I do not want to play that because that will freak me out. But I do want to pop out the chat. Okay, so here's this. No, not that. I want to be able to paste stuff for you. And I think I got it figured out. Yay! Hang on, hang on. Where am I? Where am I at, Chuck? Oh, here's the Quora article that I'm going to talk about now. So let's... Window. Mozilla Firefox. Boom. So I just put that in the chat. I think... Go chat. Go chat. Go chat. How come I'm not in the chat? Or is the chat delayed? Maybe the chat's delayed. I see all your questions. Maybe I'm blocked from my own chat. Ah! What happened? Why is it that it... Yeah. It hasn't appeared yet. Rubab, you appeared, but I didn't appear. Wow. My own YouTube channel. I mean, my own YouTube, and I can't. I'm logged in. What does that mean? Testing. Maybe... So that part works. Oh, shoot. Okay, I'm going to guess that they don't. I know what it is. I'm going to copy some of this text that you can probably type into a search engine. Yeah. Yeah, I think Rubabi right. That's exactly it. So I'm going to... I'm just going to post a bunch of text that I bet if you Google will get you where you need to do. Come on. PyCon India 2021 is will be online. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I pasted the search text that you can go search this thing. 2021 what would so Pranab what would what would be my talk I guess I could come up with something yeah Siva that's what I'm that's that's what I'm talking about uh, your course helping me I'm basically a non-CS background working professional in the MIS domain and MIS is another another um, educational uh, activity that uh, another major that I think doesn't leave you with the joy and so adding Python for Everybody and all these other courses is great. But let's go back to, um, uh, let's, get, let's go back to the first programming job. And so you can, you can read this and you'll see that these words sound very much like the kinds of things that I talk about, right? Um, you know, and, and so the first programming job is really, really difficult. And I talk about this. And I talk about why are entry-level jobs so hard to find? And um, it's just because it's really hard to post them because so many people want entry-level jobs. Um, and the skill level of all those people is wild. And so um, you, it turns out that what you probably should do is find a company to work for and then evolve into a job. And so it's a lot easier to apply for some of these jobs from the inside than the outside. So I tell people, I say, find the place you want to work and get a job. And so probably if you want to work for a technology place, find a QA job, quality assurance. So like when in the Sakai project, you might say, I want to help you, Dr. Chuck. I want to help you with um, Sakai. And I'm like, oh, go fix some bugs. And you're like, well, that's really hard. Okay, I'll leave. I won't come back. So what we've learned is that 
the way to bring people in so that they can learn our culture and our organization and learn our software is to have them do quality assurance. And then some people like say, I've gotten good at quality assurance and now I'm ready to like make this software better. And so you can take that as a strategy as well. And so you're like, oh, I don't want to do quality assurance. That's beneath me. And the answer is they're not going to post a job that you actually want. They want that. They don't want, they, they, they're, they're going to, they're not going to post the job that you want. They're going to let that person who's working in QA have the job that you want. So you have to go work in QA. Work in a call center. Do stuff. Find ways into companies that you want to work for that do, don't say, you know, I want this job. i just give an example from my wife. She wanted an, a human resources job, right? And uh, she spent a long time trying to find that job. And she ended up in a human resources job, which I thought was not a good use of her skills. But she ended up in that. And then she went into another job, and she could have moved into human resources. Um, and so the, the key thing is figure out where you, where you want to work is more important than what you do. And so find a QA job, tech support job, a uh, phone call support job. And if you're going to a technology company and you go like, I know Python and I know this stuff, you're applying for a phone call job and you're like, I actually know something. And they're like, whoa, most of the people applying for this phone call job don't know anything. So you're hired. And then you'll be, and then whatever job you get, even if you feel like it's not like, it's, you know, that you're somehow way more awesome than that job. Don't feel that way. Every job you're doing is an interview for the next job. Do an awesome job of what you're working on. Live in the moment. Don't be like, I'm going to be a great Python programmer someday, and I'm just doing QA right now, and QA is beneath me, and I'm not good. I mean, it's I'm, this. I don't deserve this horrible QA job. Said so, nope. You want to be the best QA person ever because that's how you're going to get that new job. And so I have never planned for my next job. But by doing the job that you're currently doing really, really, really well, your next job will often come and find you. So, oh, there you go. Google shows the core answer. Yeah, I guess if you put enough specific words in. Um, Yeah, you want to go for the master's degree, but sometimes continue with the job. That's part of the reason, Shabam, Shabam um, that's why we did the master's of online data science, right? Is that we get a lot of people who have a family, perhaps, have a job, perhaps. Um, it's still a lot of work. Just because you can keep your family and keep, keep stay with your family and keep your job doesn't mean that it's not a lot of work. And um, we just graduated our first uh, cohort of online master's students and I have so much respect. I mean, the faculty members in the Master of Online Data Science that we have at the University of Michigan, the faculties complain about the faculty members complain about burnout because the pace is so rapid. But we faculty members, we work for four weeks and then we get some time off, and then we work for four weeks and get some time off. You as the students are like four weeks, four weeks, four weeks, four weeks, and you're doing like two things in four weeks. I don't know how the students, the mad students do it. They, but they do, and then they graduate, and they're awesome, and they learn a lot. And you think online doesn't teach you a lot. This Master's of Online Data Science at University of Michigan School of Information is a tremendous thing. So you, you can have it both ways, but there are consequences, right? It's not easy. It doesn't mean it's free. Learning, learning a master's degree in one or two, the, the con content we expect you to learn in one or two years, uh, Machine learning and data mining and SQL and da, 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 research methods and statistics. It's a lot to learn. And um, you'll be glad when it's over. And you'll be glad for two reasons. First, you'll be glad that you can get more sleep. And you'll be glad that you have that knowledge. So, okay. Yeah, Chinma. Uh, Chinmaya. I, uh, what is the future of dot net, not te, dot net technology? I... Uh, I saw that go by the first time. So um, you, you probably figured out that I'm a big fan of open source, but that doesn't mean I'm an, uh, an enemy of Microsoft. Um, I, I think the .NET technology is fine. I think the key that has become somewhat obvious 
even though Microsoft, I don't think, has really fully understood it, is that the war, the the what we define as server software, that's that ship has sailed. And I'm sure there are lots of places that use NT server still and SQL server and 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 that's fine. I play hockey with a guy whose whole job is to run a Microsoft giant database cloud for all this .NET. .NET, you can make a lot of money because nobody wants to do it. It's like, I don't want to do .NET. I learned all this open source stuff in college, and now you're going to make me learn all this closed source stuff. But the one thing that's true about .NET for, as, for a long, long time, and that is that the physical devices that businesses are going to use is going to be Windows for a very, very long time. I mean, I'm sitting here as a Mac guy, but that's because I'm a crazy faculty member at a university and I get to have expensive toys. But, you know, you you walk into a business, you're going to see Dells as long as the eye can see. Dell, Windows, Windows 10 with auto updates and VPNs and there's all this IT support. And so while I think that the NT server, there's jobs that you can get and sometimes the jobs that are not expanding you can make the most money at because no one wants to go into a field like how to manage NT servers. Um, and so .NET is going to be around for a very, very long time. Um, I have at times in my career uh, built Windows software and I have been uh, nothing but impressed by Micros the quality of Microsoft's development tools, the quality of Microsoft's documentation, the quality of Microsoft's libraries, the ease of use of using Microsoft's libraries. Out here in the open source world, if you want to do a library that's going to convert like um, QuickTime movies to MP4s, you're just going to sit and go, holy crap, right? And you're going to like, oh, well, I run this thing, but what if it's Python? What if it's Java? How does PHP do it? i got to build a back-end server under Docker, and that's how I'm going to convert my... Quick times to uh, to MP4s. You go into Windows, you go like, how do you convert Quick Time to MP4? They'll be like, well, there's this library called System dot blah dot blah dot blah dot convert dot Quick Time to MP4, and it's right there, and you call it with two parameters, and like, great, and it's upgraded, and it works, and Microsoft makes sure it works, and there's not 14 ways to do it, and that I found wonderful. I really like the fact that Microsoft just works very hard at good documentation, internally consistent documentation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and especially if you're building some kind of a client tool. You know, but increasingly the tools are web tools, even in the Microsoft world. Um, and so, you know, it's just it, do you and and increasingly those tools are not running on Microsoft servers, although there still plenty are. And so I, I think .NET has a really great future, but I do think that sort of the, the pie chart of overall computing technology um, is going to change. And .NET, which is both a client, uh, both a front end, you know, both a, a laptop and a server architecture, I think micro, Microsoft's NT server's future as a server architecture is to just kind of, they're not going to give up on it and they're not going to throw it away, but they're just, they're like, oh man, because if you look at Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud, it's got Linux all over the place. If you, if you do GitHub, Microsoft's involved in so much open source stuff now. And so that means that Microsoft and Windows subsystem for Linux, right? And so if you look at the thing called WSL, Windows subsystem for Linux, Microsoft is not messing around. You can put your Linux on your Windows and you can type all those Linux commands. And and you might think, well, why are they doing that? Well, that's because we developers really like Linux environments. You look at the product of VS Code. VS Code is an amazing editor. By the way, I gotta reduce, I gotta redo all my courses to use VS Code and not Atom. Atom, like, I'm done with Atom. It's like slow, it's old, and yuck. But I gotta redo all the courses to be at VS Code. So Microsoft, and VS Code works on Linux. VS Code works on Mac, works on Linux. And it works on Windows. And it works online. 
So Microsoft is not dumb. Microsoft owns GitHub. Microsoft is not dumb. GitHub is not converting to NT server anytime soon. VS Code is not converting to any NT server anytime soon. So if you look at the amount of work that's going on in Microsoft as a pie chart, how much 10 years ago did Microsoft work on Linux? None. How much is Microsoft and the amount that Microsoft is doing with Linux may be small in terms of how many employees they have. It'll be interesting when Office comes out on Linux. It'll be interesting. But the number of people working on Linux is growing and growing and growing and growing. Right? And Microsoft understands that by embracing Linux, they're much more powerful. And that's no different than the Apple Macintosh that I'm using many years ago and pray, embrace the BSD, Unix BSD operating system as its kind of foundation and then build a really beautiful user interface on top of it. So I think what you're going to find is Microsoft, it, don't, you know, don't bet on this. It's not going to happen next year. But 10 years from now, you will see a difference just like in Microsoft, you've seen a difference in the past 10 years. I think what we'll see in Microsoft in the next 10 years is significant. And your question originally was a .NET question. And so what I would imagine is going to be the future of all these corporate offices and their computers that are sitting in front of these corporate people, they're going to come from Dell and they're going to run Windows. But inside Windows is going to be at least 50% Linux because it's a very efficient way to run and secure, etc. Security is important. Windows is still lousy for security. But it's still going to have .NET. And why? .NET is just a library. It's a library of routines that you can call. And I already said that it's a well-documented library. You find things in it. Someday, I'll want .NET on Linux. And then we'll start doing it. And maybe they'll open source it. OK, wait, I think I went too far there. 10 years is a, a short time when it comes to Microsoft open sourcing some of their core technologies, I'm guessing. Um, and so, so I think .NET's a fine investment. Um, I wouldn't, if I went to a school that was all .NET and the only thing they taught me was .NET, I would get a little nervous because I don't think .NET is the expanding part of the tech field. I think Linux and open source is the expanding part of the tech field, at least on the server side. Um, and so if you're not learning open source, of course, if you come and you learn open source at a place like University of Michigan, it's not like we're going to teach you the thing that you're going to use in your job exactly the next day. That It's hard to know what the job is going to be. So, yeah. Uh, Sergio, what do I recommend for a GUI in Python? I don't know. I wish it were that way. That's, I, you know, when we're talking about what to do for desktop applications, it'd be nice if Python could do that. And I know that I've, I've talked to people in my classes that, their job is to build GUIs for Python, and they can do it, and they're pretty happy with it. Um, I just haven't felt like there's any GUI for Python desktop applications that has reached a level where a lot of companies would say, that's plan A, that, that we're going to build a desktop app for X, that we're going to build a Python plus a GUI. It just it hasn't become, it's not like you can't do it. And uh, the lady that was telling me about her job building Python GUIs, she was really building a GUI to kind of wrap some back-end processes that are all Python. And you'd kind of check some check boxes and, and then hit a Go button. And it was just a way so people didn't have to use command line to run all the background process, back back-end processes that she was building. And her stuff looked great, and it was not hard to work with. But if you think about how would you write a word processor on Windows, the answer is you're not going to write a word processor on Windows using Python with a GUI because that GUI is not s stable or robust enough, et cetera. It doesn't even, and it's not going to look pretty enough. So I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. I'm just, it's not, to me, if I was going to go write a, Ma a Windows application, I'd go probably do Visual Studio.net and just bite the bullet um, and use the, use whatever. Pro Game Fixers, Dr. Chuck, I am interested in knowing how you deal with cold emails by students from all over the world and which emails you reply to. 
That was actually one of the topics that I wanted to talk about today. Um, what time have we got here? Oh, we're after 11 o'clock. Does anybody have any coding challenges for me? Okay. So I'm interested in knowing how you deal with cold emails from students all over the world and which emails do you reply to. So my email address is csev at umich.edu. And if you send me email, it'll go beep on the screen, right? I, I don't have like a, a bunch of assistants that read my email for me. Um, and so it's not like I filter my email. Uh, people send me cold call emails all the time. So there are, are three, let's just say, but there's three kinds of emails that I have kind of a stock pattern I go through. Uh, one email is someone wants to connect into, in LinkedIn. A lot of people just as soon as they finish their certificate on Coursera, they put it in LinkedIn and they want to make a connection. Um, I don't use LinkedIn much and um, I use Twitter. So it's okay to get lots of followers on Twitter, and it's okay if you follow me on LinkedIn, but you'll find that I'm really boring on LinkedIn. I don't connect with people on LinkedIn that I don't actually know. So if I meet somebody and I'm like, I, this, I'm gonna be working with this person, or I have to work with something, someone or like a grad student graduates and I wanna keep track of them, then I connect on LinkedIn. I only connect to people that I actually have done something with in LinkedIn. Tim, I should probably connect with you on, on LinkedIn if I'm not, we're not already connected. I bet we are connected. So. I will get anywhere from 40 to 100 LinkedIn requests a week, and I don't, I don't connect to any of them. I really wish I did more in LinkedIn, um, like this Quora thing I talked about. I'm, I, I got all excited about it. I'm a little disappointed because they're sort of trying to monetize it now, and so even Twitter's trying to monetize themselves. I'm getting kind of frustrated about that. I don't want to put all my stuff in a place that gets monetized. I should start writing white papers and putting them out in LinkedIn, but I haven't done that. So the one cold call, one cold email I get is for a LinkedIn request, which I simply just you know say no, 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 and I got to clean them up or else I'll have thousands of them. And so don't bother sending me a LinkedIn request unless we've done some work together. And of course, if I've done some work together, then I then I want a LinkedIn request. I want to keep track of people. Um, the next the next thing that's that's a bit heartbreaking, but I say no to it all the time, is uh, students say, I just finished your MOOC. Can you write me a letter of recommendation? And I don't. And um, don't feel too bad. You can take my on-campus class, and you can sit in class with me a whole semester, answer a bunch of questions, and say, Chuck, would you write me a letter of recommendation? And I'll say no. Um, and so I don't write letters of recommendation for on-campus uh, students either. Um, and I understand that I almost wish we would stop doing this as part of our admissions process, but you're going to need three letters of recommendations to get an admissions to our master's program. Like what exactly, how does that matter? Maybe PhD, sure. PhD is a more complex process. For a master's degree, do I really need to get three letters of recommendation for a master's degree? I've never part of any admissions process like really spent much time on the letters of recommendation. But you, they make you get them and you think if you don't get them, they're not gonna admit you and a lot of places maybe won't even like, they consider your application incomplete if you don't get a letter of recommendation. So I understand that everybody wants to get a letter of recommendation from a, a well-known influential person and there, there must be some teachers that'll give you a letter of recommendation. Maybe they give you a form letter of recommendation, I don't know. Um, you know, you could tell me in the chat how this really works because people say, I just finished your class. Could you write me a letter of recommendation? And I have a pretty stock reply. I reply to most of these and I say, no, I don't give letters of recommendations even to on-campus students just for taking my class. The only letter of recommendation that I give is when someone, I've worked with someone and it has to do with this. And that is, I won't write a glowing letter of recommendation for someone who took a MOOC and say, I know Bob and Bob is great. Bob has these cool anti-gravity boots and he can float through the air and Bob's Java skill is really unquestioned and whatever. I mean, that's a lie. I don't know if you have anti-gravity boots or not, right? And so I, if I'm gonna write you a letter of recommendation that says that because you took a class, I'm gonna say that 
that Bob took SI-664 from me. I didn't notice anything stolen during the class, so I assume that Bob's not a thief. Bob did Bob's homework, so that was good, but that's all I can say about Bob. And I'm imagining you're like applying for a master's degree, and here comes this letter that says, Bob didn't steal anything when he took my class. Is that the best you can say about a person? And the answer is, yeah, it's the best I can say and be honest, because I don't didn't know you. I didn't work with you. I don't. I didn't give you an assignment. I didn't give you a, a task and have you come back. And have, we didn't talk. I didn't even know you. So, so the only people I give letters of recommendation are is to those who I work with. And those letters are fun and joyful to write. And I'll be like, Stephanie takes so much initiative. She made my job so easy. She dealt with complexity and, and ambiguity. And then if you look, she did all this extra work and uh, the students who were in Stephanie's discussion section, Stephanie's a real person, by the way, just got so much out of it and I got so much out of it. It was an honor to work with her and I would, I would hire again in a minute. That's what a letter of recommendation should sound like, right? Meaning, uh, Stephanie's amazing. I was honored to work with her for two years. Now she's graduating, going out the real world. Hi, Stephanie, if you're listening. Um, those letters are easy. And I've got a whole file of them. I write them all the time. And, and, and I do them all the time. I just don't like write letters of recommendation. So that's a second kind of cold email that I get. But, um, that I, but that one, those I usually... Um, so the... So sometimes someone will say, how do I get my job? And I send them a core article. <laughs> That's kind of a stock answer. Um, another, uh, that, another frustrating kind of email that I get that I don't have a good answer for. And that is, um, someone says, I'm stuck on problem 7.4 from Python for everybody. Could you take a look at my code and could you tell me what's wrong? And I would say that nineteen out of twenty times I just delete those. If it just turns out that that I can see it and I can look at it in five seconds and I see what's wrong, I'll answer it. Um, but I rarely get ones that I can answer quickly because what the email usually is is I'm lost, I'm confused, I'm messed up. And I'm like, you know, I don't really want to tutor you on strings. I understand your homework, that you're working on your string homework, and I can send you the answer, but I'm not going to spend an hour walking through whatever misconceptions you have with strings. That's what the course is for. That's what the content's for. And literally, in the last 24 hours, a thousand people did that assignment based on the materials. And you got stuck, and that's fine, and everybody gets stuck. You should just relax, watch the materials again, you'll get it. Everybody eventually does. So I'm not going to spend an hour tutoring people on stuff that's sitting in my textbooks and sitting online. So I'm not going to do that. And so just asking me to help you with an assignment. Now, there is one category of those kinds of things where a person says, I think your auto grader is broken. Here's how my application is working, and it seems to be working to me, and here's the ID and password. You can log right into it, and here's what happens when I submit it to the auto grader, and it says this, this, and this. Now, just because the auto grader doesn't like your application doesn't mean that it's my auto grader's fault, because, again, thousands of people a day run those auto graders and succeed. But that doesn't mean I never have bugs. And so sometimes what I find is when I see someone who's very thoughtful and has shown me exactly what's going on to the point where they understand the homework and I think they would get the obvious little things right, is I sometimes look at it not that my auto grader has a bug, which I do want to catch if it does, but sometimes my auto grader is not communicating well enough. And so I will engage sometimes, and I've even had Zoom calls with students like, do it again. Like, don't you see that message right there? Oh, yeah, I need to bold that, or I need to put an arrow or something. So I often will, if it looks like it's a usability problem, I'm, I'm kind of interested in those because then that makes the course better for everybody. And if, the, if this seems like a student has really got their act together and things are going well, 
Um, so I, that once in a great while. The other kind of cold call that I get, um, usually that's, that's just super frustrating to me, but I don't have a good answer for it, is um, students who, and this is in particular on Coursera, who have had like, you know, they uploaded the wrong image for a peer graded assignment and that image in the peer graded assignment was something they just Googled for and downloaded and uploaded. It's exactly the same as a downloaded one. And then somebody says that's, you know, you violated the honor code by uploading someone else's work. And then everybody, not everybody, students immediately want to say, well, that was a mistake. It was like on a Tuesday and like I was clicking in a bunch of windows and da da da. And everybody does make mistakes. But then they want to appeal to me and they want me to kind of look it all over and figure it out. And the fact that, you know, when you violate honor code on Coursera, they're pretty grumpy about that. And they want me to kind of like go back through everything and listen and adjudicate that this person was wrong and that happened and this happened and that happened. And I honestly don't have time for that. And um, I don't have time to spend an hour to call up the teaching assistants and say, how come this? And then they say, well, this is the one that's downloaded and they uploaded the downloaded thing. And then what often happens if I look into these things is it turns out that the student is has uploaded a thing and the teaching assistant's caught it and the student is telling me a big long story that about the mistake and how a dog stepped on their computer cable at the wrong time and and I I feel bad I mean I I, I wish that I, I I am sometimes tempted to just throw those assignments away. Because if it makes you unhappy or it makes you go find a stock solution and then upload it because you're in a hurry or you're frustrated, I, I, I don't, I feel bad about that. I don't like, I'm not like, oh, great, I caught somebody. I'm like, oh, dang it, it I didn't mean for you to, to do that. I didn't mean for you to get caught and now there's consequences. And I don't have an easy or quick way to unwind that. I don't have an easy or quick way to investigate that. Um, and so it, it, I see them, I feel bad about them. I rarely do anything about them because in the ones that I've looked at, it's usually more, far more complex than it sounds. And it's very frustrating. And after I investigated, if it turns out that it was an honor code oil violation, like, why did I just spend two hours digging through all this stuff and bothering everybody? And then it just wasn't honor code violation. So I don't do much with that. Um, then there's a, there's another really um, joyful kind of email that I get, and that is um, sometimes I get an email from a student that has something rather unique. Often it's a, it might be a condition of one form or another that makes learning difficult. Uh, and that they have tried lots of other lots of things, um, and they haven't worked. And then, and then my courses work for them, and they're always very thankful. And uh, and that's how I met all of the blind folks from India, right? I'm like, really, you're blind, and you could use my course? Like, this is cool. And I finally <laughs> went there and visited them um, in India when I went to PyCon 2019 or 2018, whenever, it was, oh, no, I'm not, I don't remember. But, you know, and so when I hear from someone who has autism or someone who has ADHD um, or someone who's blind and somehow my material reached them, uh, that brings me uh, great joy. Uh, sometimes those letters are very long. I read them all. Uh, Sometimes it takes a while for me to reply because they make me think so much uh, when I see those. And so if I reply to that, I'd be like, I'm sorry it's been a month. <laughs> I saw your email right away, and I've been driving around thinking about your email. And now I, and I could have wrote it like a month ago, but now I've been thinking about it for a month. Maybe it'll be a little better when I write it right now. And so I always try to... Um, thank those people and celebrate their success and um, and I try to learn something from them right you know 
in terms of the blind folks that took my class. I'm like, what, what about it? Was it that, and so, and I'm now learning from some of those interactions where because I teach so many people, um, it's a diverse crowd and I'm getting examples of uh, people that are uh, challenging to teach in traditional ways. And so now I can actually learn from those people and, uh, and I get great joy from that and I learn, and I learn uh, uh, from that. Um, I think that covers uh, most of uh, the cold calls. Uh, I guess. I guess. Well, no. Okay. So there's a, there's another um, set of things that uh, I get, and that is people say I want to help, and that's really cool. And uh, sometimes they say that I want to help translate your materials. Sometimes they say I want to I want to work with you. The whole Working with me is something I'm frustrated because I don't yet have a good way to take my most advanced students, although I'm working on that, um, to take my most advanced students and have them collaborate with me, which would then lead to a LinkedIn um, thing. So I'd like to do that. But, um, but the problem is, is I just don't have a way to figure out who the right people, who the right students to work with are, who has this, who has, which ones have the talent and what kind of work they can do to start out so that I can then mentor them to the point where um, they can actually help me solve the problems I'm trying to solve. And uh, usually that's a, to help me solve the problems that I'm currently solving, you kind of need a pretty high level of skill. Doing QA and stuff, that doesn't require uh, so much skill. And so again, I talked about how you get your first job by starting in QA sometimes. When I get my act together, the way that you will be able to work with me is probably starting with QA, with quality assurance. Um, and I meet some really like amazing people who, like I, there, there's one high school student that's helped me um, with the, the C Programming for Everybody textbook. And I just started getting these GitHub pull requests from a person I didn't even know. And, and they just were good, and I would approve the pull requests. And finally, I'm like, who are you? Like, where did you come from? And why are you working on this? And why are you so smart? You seem really like you know a lot of stuff. You're very good. You're like finding mistakes in a C textbook. And that particular person high school student, I want to say Pakistan. And then my next question is like, you're just in high school and you're this smart? And so there, there are all kinds of moments of joy that I get from cold emails and that's why I read them all, right? That's why I see them all, I read them all. I take, you know, sometimes I'll be a little tired and I'll be done coding for the day and I'll just kind of go through and go through some of those emails and some of those things on LinkedIn. Um, and just and just process it. So there you go. Alfonso. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question and then I'm gonna ask the chat to answer it. Predict what my answer is going to be. So here we go. Here's the question, and I'll give the chat like a minute to guess what the answer. How, what I'm going to say is the answer to the question. Um, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Alfonso says, Dr. Chuck, what is your fi favorite Python library for data science and why? So, chat room, you have 60 seconds to figure out what Dr. Chuck is going to answer to that question. And in the meantime, Julia, I have no idea about Julia. So, um, so Amadeus, uh, can I apply to the University of Michigan as an undergraduate, even if I'm an international student? You make me want to study at University of Michigan, but I don't think they give fee waivers or financial aid. So Amadeus, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that the undergraduate admissions process at the University of Michigan is really challenging and difficult um, because even throughout the United States, we have so many high school students that are so great and they all apply to you know eight or nine really great schools, including Michigan. and and they have a terrible problem of working through so many talented 
ap applicants at the undergraduate level and then knowing they can't admit them all. And so, so many talented students don't, um, don't make it just because the numbers, not because they're not worthy. And there's so many worthy students that don't make it. And so if you're in the United States and you want to go to the University of Michigan as an undergraduate, um, sometimes going and getting a two-year degree somewhere else at a community college and coming in is a better way to go. Junior transfer admission is a better way to go than undergraduate. Um, just because the numbers are different, the way you're looked at, you're in a smaller pool, you get more direct attention. Um, and so junior admission is easier than freshman admission. And then master's admission is even easier, but then you need to go get a bachelor's degree. And the reason that master's admission is even easier is that when you go get that bachelor's degree, you answer one of the questions that's difficult. To, the most difficult question of admission is, can you handle advanced education? And if you are 17 years old, and you're coming to the United States and you're going to go to the University of Michigan, it's really hard for them to say, oh, you're going to make it. You're going to be okay. We don't want to bring students in and have them not make it. Um, and then master's degrees are also uh, have a better chance of financial aid. Um, so, oh, beautiful soup, Pranab. That's, that's who wants to do that one? So Victor wants to, so you want me to do beautiful soup. Where is it? Where is it, Victor? Proper date timing sample. Oh, man. Oh, Victor, okay. So date and time is like one of the hard things, but I'll try. I'll put that down. I'll spend some time working on date time. But it, you'll, I'll just reveal myself as like totally incompetent, right? Oh, I see. Beautiful Soup Pranab was your answer. Deepak, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, SciPy. None of you are correct. But it is time for me to answer. Alfonso's question. Dr. Chuck, which is your favorite Python library for data science and why? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't use any of them. Ask Chris Brooks. Okay. With that, I would say that Chris Brooks would say, Pandas. Pandas is awesome. Pandas is cool. And Jupyter Notebooks are cool. So Jupyter Notebooks and Pandas would be the first two things um, that I would say are the, are the place to start. Um, Pandas... Pandas is its own kind of database-like thing, and so Pandas is pretty cool. I just never used it. I mean, I, I could not teach Hello World in Pandas right now. I couldn't. And uh, NumPy and SciPy all, and Matplotlib, all of those sound great. So, so Deepak is a great answer, which is not a Dr. Chuck answer, because Deepak probably knows more about those things than I do. So, Okay. So, Nima, I'm a huge fan. I was a biologist, no skills in programming. I learned Python from your great courses. Would you give me some advice on how I can enhance my skills in machine learning and databases? Um, I have done exactly zero machine learning. I understand that it's not that hard, and so I don't have really any good advice on where to go for machine learning, although I know that our master's in applied data science, it's a big part of it. Uh, I don't even know if Ad Swapy, um, our applied data science with Python, does it. So let's see if they do machine learning. Advanced data science with Python Michigan. Oh, yeah, there we go. Everyone is like, oh, it's not advanced, it's applied. There we go. First link. Hey, Chris, good to see you. Courses. Reduction data science, plotting and charting. I mean, applied machine learning. There we go. Look at that. So I'm going to put, I'm going to Google, put the Google, Google click in here. In the old uh, in the old chat room, given that I can't put URLs in because it it doesn't trust me. Oop, might undo that. Okay, 
So there's a machine learning class in there. And so, um, so there's a machine learning class in uh, applied data science with Python. And the reason I like that is I know that people go straight from Python for everybody into add swappy applied data science with Python. And so that, I, that means that like you're two courses away from at least some machine learning. And the key to machine learning is machine learning is one of those skills that um, like object oriented programming, I guess, where you can kind of know the mechanics of it, but you need applications to understand it well. And so give yourself a little bit of time and a break um, to pick machine learning up first, kind of in the in the simplest, most simple, basic understanding of it. And the, the problem, I think, is that people don't understand the basics of machine learning, but they think they're solving a problem with it. And then they're just, they do, they'll, they just, it's like, you know, sending a rocket off and it just smashes into something and go, all everything goes wrong. And so you should understand machine learning from a very basic and slow perspective so that when you apply it, you really know what, what you're applying. Um, so what are your thoughts on code wars and other sites like that? Um, I don't like code wars. I don't like anything that um, turns algorithms and data structures, data structures into like weapons and uses algorithms and data structures as a way to sort people. The whole computer science profession has this obsession with sorting and putting people at high to low rank. And um, Code Wars kind of emphasizes that and I don't like it. I want, I want people to be awesome and I want everybody to be awesome. I, don't, I do not want to rank. I mean, among the colleagues that I adore and respect, I mean, both my colleagues at the University of Michigan School of Information and my colleagues like in the Sakai Project, I don't need any kind of ranking. I don't need to know if person A is is higher ranked than person B. I know that both of them are awesome and they they bring different things. And same as two colleagues, how can I like rank them? We rank uh, we rank ourselves for like raises and stuff. I'm like, I don't care. You can rank me last so someone else could feel better. I don't care. Okay. Oh, let me. Uh, shoot, I'm just talking and talking. It's 11:38. Wow, the time has flied, and my my throat doesn't hurt, which is good. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the curriculum. Let me see. Don't take the screen yet. Let me see if I can find this. Let me just look here. Rise. Oh yeah, my network just went down. Uh, what happened? How come my Wi-Fi just stopped on my laptop? <laughs> my laptop is I'm not, I'm not talking well to, uh, I don't know if AirPlay is working. AirPlay seems to be working, wow. That's not it, that's not it. Okay, so you can take the screen anytime you want. So I was talking earlier about how um, I have moved from, yep, it is confused. Airplay is confused. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's not, my AirPlay is not showing up because the Wi-Fi just mysteriously quit on me. No, no, well, I wasn't. It was dead. Wi-Fi was completely dead on my laptop. And now I can't seem to find, um, the AirPlay options are not there. 
we'll give it a, we'll, sorry for the technical difficulties. We'll, let, let's work on this. Does AirPlay use Wi-Fi? Yeah. Oh, here we go. It's funny. And wireless Wi-Fi didn't work. Are we back on Studio A? Is AirPlay working again? Okay. Okay. So there we go. I, how we route this stuff around is kind of weird. So, um, so, uh, so I've, I've moved to an understanding where I'm trying to build a curriculum, not a, um, not just a bunch of courses. And I'm actually working with a bunch of universities who are adopting not just my curriculum, but they're taking a curriculum. And so this is a thing called the, the LCMC, Lower Cost Model for Independent Colleges Consortium, and it's a bunch of uh, liberal arts schools in the United States. And I'm helping them build a, uh, an undergraduate major. There's me and there's Colleen Van Lent, both of us from University of Michigan. And we are sharing our materials. And so you will see that the MOOCs you'll see that this entire undergraduate curriculum is really based on the stuff that uh, I'm teaching. And so Internet History Technology is their first class in the thing. And, uh, Python for Everybody, Python for Everybody, Web Development, Application Development, you know, Teach You Django, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's from Colleen. And then the, my Django class is in there. And so what happens is these small colleges are actually building a curriculum that's like my courses plus a few other courses. I'm not the only faculty member building this, but the majority of it is me. And so you can actually see some things that I'm in the process of building right now. And so this is not scheduled until next fall, but an introduction to see. I'm developing content for this curriculum also. And remember, I told you about uh, Dr. Chuck Online, right? So Dr. Chuck Online is like my own ultimate curriculum, but it's not going to be that long that small colleges are going to be giving computer science degrees based on this curriculum that I've been building uh, since 2013. And so you can see the courses um, that I'm coming up, that I'm on the hook to, to build. One is the C class and the other is the hardware class. And, um, and so I'm working on that right now. And so I've talked to some of you about uh, cc4e.com, C programming for everybody. And, and I've started working on that. And it's, it's, it's unfinished, right? It's not done yet. Um, and I, was, I, was, I promised you that I was going to be ready to teach this class like in early September. And I'm not. I just got busy. And so it's still, you'll hear from me when the time comes. Uh, what I ended up doing was earlier in the summer, which I, and I talked about in previous office hours, earlier in the summer I had built all of the infrastructure to make this work. And I'd recorded one lecture, and I built one auto grader, and I built the whole thing, and I built, I figured out the security of it. And I still now, I, I built the technology framework to build this course, but then I have to build the content. I got to record all the lectures and build auto graders, make assignments and all that stuff. And what happened was, is once I got the hard parts figured out, then like I'd taken so much time that like the rest of the things that are priority happened. Like now it's September and my first priority is my on-campus students. And so this will come. Um, I will, I will finish this up. Um, and, but then I also took some time this summer, and um, and I'm starting to work on the thing that comes after. Uh, the thing that comes after is my hardware class. So hardware for everybody's coming. And I want to show you my first experiment and show you what hardware for everybody's going to be like. Okay. So what I have here, I'll try to show it to you as well as I can is a breadboard. So here you have a breadboard. 
These are just wires and stuff. I guess I'll use my pen here. So um, this circuit, this electric circuit with a battery, this circuit is the most foundational electronic circuit that makes computers smart. Computers work on ones and zeros. Computer hardware works on ones and zeros. And little pulses of electricity run through wires. And I've got this wire here. And this circuit that uses a transistor and two resistors, a battery and a switch, implements a NOT gate. And that is, if its input is a zero, its output is a one. And if its input is a one, its output is a zero. So it's a NOT gate. So if you look at it, you see that I, my input is zero because I haven't pushed this little button yet, and it's glowing red. And if you push this button, it stops glowing red. Two transistors, two transistors and I mean, two resistors and one transistor. So the transistor is the essence of solid state computers. And it's this little black thing, and I probably can't see it. It's got three little legs. You know, I can see it, but you can't see it very well. Okay, I'll just show it to you. It's got three little legs. One, two, three. It's got uh, two. So what it is, is it's a, it's a switch. And so what it does is if the, it, it sees... Um, current, it's a, called an NPN transistor, and it is, it, it is an open circuit if it sees current on the middle one, and it's a closed circuit if it sees a, no current. And so right now, um, actually no, I got that backwards. And so right now, the current from my battery is being blocked from going to its ground Oh, yeah, I'm looking at it. I'm supposed to be showing you this. The current from the battery is being blocked to go to ground, and so it's forced to go through this little LED. But when I push the button, then the current from the battery goes to ground, and so the current is not going to the LED. And it's because this little tiny transistor is a switch. The current not going to ground, and so it has, it's forced to go through, and the, the resistors are basically making it so that it doesn't heat up too much. Um, and so right now, the current is going from the battery to the, not, the output, and what will happen is I'm going to short the one side of the LED to ground, and so then there's no light. And so this is, this is, there's different technologies. There's called CMOS and NMOS, and this is, this is the older technology and the fact that this battery when I plug the battery in it's always leaking to ground and so this is the heat this is the thing that causes all the heat inside of a microprocessor and the fact that in order to have a one a one is basically current but the zero when I make the zero it actually is more current because it's sucking down to the ground so that the current doesn't go through the output. And so I have bought a bunch of these things. The first thing to build is always a NOT gate. The next thing I'll build is what's called a NAND gate. And the next thing I'm going to build is a what's called a half adder. And then I'm going to build a thing we call a flip-flop. I'm going to build the whole thing based on transistors and resistors. And, and there's this place called Jamaica, I don't know how you say it, that allows me to create a materials list where I can, you can get a, I can have a materials list that includes a battery, a breadboard, some wires, some switches, some LEDs, some transistors, and some resistors. And you will be able to, for like $20, um, purchase, if you want, a kit. So you can go through my inside of a microprocessor class. And then you'll be able to build all these things. And I understand that even $25 is too much, right? So I'm going to build an online version of this so that you can wire these things. You can do these things because you, 
you you pull them in and out. So like, oops, I just pulled out the, the battery wire and I have to know where to put that back in, or I there, put it back in. As a matter of fact, I can't leave it running with the battery in or it'll just drain the battery by just heating up this little light all the time. It'll, you know, so it's like I gotta turn my little computer off to save the battery. But I will get you a kit that you can buy, I believe pretty much anywhere in the world you can get it shipped from the Jamaica place, and I'm gonna make an online version. That's exactly the same thing. And so, for those of you who've taken computer science and you know something about hardware, you know that what I just described as the scope of my hardware uh, course is really tiny. So I'm gonna teach you a NOT gate, a NAND gate, a half adder, and a flip-flop, and use transistors and resistors and LEDs and switches for all of it and build all those things and demonstrate them all to you, right? And give you a kit that allows you to build them as well. And then, and this is one of the things about my courses, I'm gonna stop. Because all I want you to know is that if you really decided to do a career in hardware that you could take these four circuits that I'm gonna teach you and you could learn more and make a full adder and then a ripple carry adder, and then a this, and then a, and a multiplier, and all that stuff. And if you really wanted to learn hardware, go ahead, we'll be professional. But I believe that everybody needs to understand this circuit. Everybody needs to understand that circuit. Everybody needs to understand it to the point where they say, you know, I could do it if I felt like it. Not, I'm capable of doing it, but I could do it if I felt like it. And so, um, and so then what I'm gonna do is I'm not going to go too much farther in hardware. I might have a tiny little lecture talking about how these four core circuits that I'm going to show you are composed to make microprocessors and then computers. Because what I really want you to understand from this hardware is how not intelligent computers really are. I mean this, you think, well that's not very smart. There's no machine learning in here. How can that be so smart? And the answer is Machine learning is just doing this billions of times. And we, the humans, are constructing these software and hardware and all this stuff. And eventually, when we have enough hardware and enough software and enough theory, it seems to be intelligent, right? And so I just want to demystify hardware. And then the other part that's hardware that's going to be is we're going to um, look at uh, what's called assembly language, which is the actual microprocessor, the native code that runs in a microprocessor. So C Python doesn't run inside computers, C doesn't run inside, Java doesn't run inside. Eventually all those translate down to this thing called machine code. And the thing that's, and machine code is way simpler. And so machine code eventually deals with the microprocessor architecture that's made up of all of these little chippy guys and that becomes like an adder or a multiplier or the ability to load from memory and how memory is built and loading from memory and storing into memory and all that stuff, right? And so when we talk about hardware inside of a microprocessor, we're gonna talk more about how you program the hardware inside of a microprocessor and talk about assembly language and you will actually, in that course, you will actually teach. You'll actually write some small amounts of assembly, not a lot, a small amount to demystify it. So the, the C the C and hardware class will are all about demystifying. So and then there is this third class and yeah, data structures. And what we're going to do then is in data structures we're going to teach you how you would build the hash. I mean not a hash. We'll use hashing to build a dictionary. And so the, the purpose of that is to actually build um, a Python dictionary, but use a language like C, which makes it very difficult. So how you would so when you're done with this class, you will have built a data structure. And I don't remember if this is mine. Yeah, this. Yeah, that's not my course. That's someone else's course. But I'm also then going to teach another course. So I got the hardware course. Let me unplug my battery here. And um, hardware course. And then I'm going to have a uh, how to build enterprise applications. Because after I've taught you C, 
the next thing I'm going to do is teach you how to work on really large pieces of software. And so that's what I want to do. And when that's said and done, and so if you look at where I'm trying to go with all that, what I'm trying to accomplish is I am going to create a program of study. Um, oh, my stomach is gurgling because I haven't had lunch yet, and it's getting to be lunchtime, four minutes lunchtime. I want to teach, I want, I, I've never wanted to be, uh, teach computer science. I've always wanted to teach programming. And in Python for Everybody, I start by teaching the joy of programming and how fun it is and how easy it is and how, how creative it is. And I want to take you on a journey from, like, programming is fun to what are the skills that I find in the best professional programmers, not the best computer scientists because those aren't the same thing, but the best professional programmers. And I want to build a class that gives you a path to being one of the a great programmer, not a great computer scientist. Great data science, that's different. Someone else is doing a new data science. Someone else could teach you computer science. But I'm going to teach you programming because programming is what I love about computers. I, uh, computer science is a necessary skill to get things done, just like hardware is a necessary skill to get things done. But for me, the skill that's made me, my career, so rich and enjoyable and lucrative is my ability to write code. And, um, and I think computer science doesn't spend enough time talking about writing code or large products and projects, etc. So that is my uh, ad for the upcoming classes, uh, CC for E um, is coming. It's been delayed. I, I bought some hardware, playing with hardware for everybody. So I got another couple things to sort of mention. Yeah, it's a... Uh, so I want to talk about um, one of the cold emails that I tend to get are people that want to translate my books. And, um, and so I, people ask if they can translate my book. This is my Introduction to Networking, which actually is the textbook of this Internet History, Technology, and Security book. It's, the, it's not the entire textbook. This is only part of the Internet. This is the technology part of the, it's the middle part of the class. But this is the book translated into Russian. And this is the book translated into Greek by Constantia. And it's already was translated a long time ago into to Spanish. And um, I get email from people that says, I want to translate your stuff. And what's really amazing to me is all the people that want to translate these books, they don't, I really never really encountered anybody that wants to do it because they want to get rich, because it's not going to get you rich. But because this is... Uh, Creative Commons, uh, CC Creative Commons Attribution, it, I own all the rights to these to these books, right? I own the rights to the Python book. I own the rights to the this book. And so I can give people permission. And one of the things that I do once they get their translation done is we work to get them published. Now, this translation for the Russian book, this was actually done by a publisher. But they look like they're a cool, fun, small publisher, and they have a lot of little tech books in Russia. And I just love the idea of my books being in Russia. And so this, this same company, uh, DMK Publishing, um, is, is going to be translating the Python book into Russian as well. And, uh, and Constantia, Constantia, she is a high school teacher that teaches math and programming in Greece. And so, so Constantia, are you on? She's probably not on. It might be too late for her. She's been on a couple of them before. Um, <laughs> Constantia, just like me, during the, North, the Northern Hemisphere summer, she was really productive, doing a lot of stuff. She translated this whole book by herself, and now she's teaching again. So her first priority has to be for her students, just like me. My first priority is my students. And so she's slowing down, um, but she did something really cool, which... So if you look at the translations, um, there's like of the Python book. There's a lot of translations of the Python book. If we go to uh, www.py4e, ooh, my stomach is growling. You have to take a different microphone when my stomach growls. 
but you know that. Okay, so if you look at the book on Python for Everybody, you see we got English, we got Spanish, we got Italian, we got Portuguese, we got Polish, we got Greek coming, we got German coming. Um, yeah, so there's a, a, a German PDF. I just got this, right? Talking to the, talking to um, uh, Heiner, uh, talking to him because he's in the. He's, he's in the final, he's reviewing his German translation. And so we're going to try to get the book published um, in, uh, in German in, uh, as well. We got the Greek version, but, but Constantia didn't stop there. So, she's, so usually what happens is everybody gets the urge to translate the book. So like this is the Italian translation. And so they're like, I want to translate the book. And so they translate the book, and we publish the book, and then that's, that's pretty much as far as it goes. So Constantia is taking a different approach to translating it to Greek. Constantia started by translating the PowerPoint slides because she wants to teach her class in Greece. Right? So she translated the PowerPoint slides. But then she got, um, she got excited and she's taken web applications for everybody. And so she knows PHP a little bit. So this whole site, Python for Everybody, is written in PHP. So here she's like, pew, pew, pew. she's like hacking on PHP and translating it into Greek. And so, uh, so actually, so if you go to this gr.py4e.com, she has it locked. And you have to have a code. And you seem to have to know Greek. And I'll tell you what, I tried to, I tried 42 as the unlock code and it didn't work. And I'm like, Constantia, what did you do? And it doesn't, 42 doesn't unlock it. And I'm like, okay, that can't be quite right. Yeah, it's in Russian. And so then I had to go translate all this. And it turns out if you type GR for Greek, because she likes Greek, GR unlocks it. And then you can go in. So if you're going to see the Greek one, you gotta you gotta type gr to unlock it. But she has translated all of the lessons, and and then she is and then the other thing she's done is she's translated powerpoints. So if I open this file right here, she's translated the powerpoints into Greek. And for her, her priority is a teacher. And then the next thing she's doing is we're working together to translate the. Um, I can't read enough to know what, what chapter we're on. Uh, she's translating the, the closed captions on the YouTube videos here. And she's just doing this and giving it to all of us because she wants to teach Python in Greece. And part of the reason that I spend so much time with people that do translation of my work is that I believe that programming at least the first programming class you take needs to be in your native language as much as possible. Uh, because it is hard, and you all know this, learning to program at the beginning is just, it's a, it, is a, it is a mental exercise that requires mental strength, and it requires dedication. And if you're wasting your brain translating from English into whatever your language is, um, that's a waste of your intellectual, the power that you could be applying to learning the stuff. And so I'm not a, I don't think everything is going to get translated because it's not. It just isn't. But I feel really fortunate that I am teaching beginning concepts. And because I have a free and open textbook, those beginning concepts can be translated into so many other um, languages and so and so the German languages come in um, the Python guy pl.pyfree.com um, this uh, the Spanish and the Polish are the most complete I would say that this Polish and the Spanish es.pyfree.com are the most translated in that um, the you, you go in and you do your auto graders and the auto graders, oh, see, I can't even read enough Polish to, oh, i got to log in.
Now I can do a lesson. So this has been translated all the way down. to the homework assignments. Look at that. The output, let's reset this. Luckily, I know my own user interface. Yeah, so if you've done Python for everybody, problem number one, you know that you just change this to a T and then you can run it. But hello world is um, been translated with you know, just a little loom not like characters. And uh, so it's, it's a complete translation. And uh, Spanish is also a similarly complete translation. Um, the Spanish is available on edX for a certificate. And so I just, what's cool about this, and I'll wrap up after this. What's cool about this is the, the community aspect of this. And that is that, um, I started this, if you look at the very first thing that I recorded in a studio just down the, down the hall, I basically said, my goal is not to just teach you programming, but to create more teachers. Because if truly programming is going to be for everybody, uh, you can't all learn it from me. And so I'm trying to create teachers. And so it, 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 it makes me really happy to see like the Polish and the Greek translations coming from teachers who are then going to teach with it. So the Polish translation comes from, um, I think his name's Andrzej. I, I can't say it very well. Oh, go back there, Chuck. www.pyfree.com. Uh, so he's a professor at a uh, university in Poznan. And, uh, and uh, Konstantia is a high school teacher. And so this, this, this gives me the best, the most joy of all is when we have more teachers, right? And, um, and when we have uh, things in uh, students' native languages. And so with that, um, I'm glad I never had, I'm glad that I never uh, had time to work on that Python date thing. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, take a look and try to, because dates are hard. I mean, dates are really hard, especially when you start thinking about time zones and things like that. Uh, it's really hard. So thank you for your participation, and we'll see you in about four weeks. Cheers.